Hello and welcome to the panel entitled Russian-Turkish Relations, Past and Present. I'm Elise Giuliano, the Director of the Program on U.S.-Russian Relations, under which this panel is organized today, and a faculty member here at Harriman Institute, Columbia University. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody and also welcome our uh, very accomplished and interesting panelists. So <clears throat> when we um, conceptualized this panel, we really had no idea that this uh that turkey would really be you know at the center both geographically and polit politically to one of the um, biggest crises and um, um dramatic um, reinterpretation of international security i.e the war russia's war on ukraine um but that is the case and each week each day even brings uh, turkey right into the middle of not just uh, russian ukrainian turkish relations but what the war means to Europe, the West, and the rest of the world. So um, I'm very happy that the panel is happening when it is. And I would like to also thank uh, Columbia University's Sabanchi Center for co-sponsoring this panel, as well as um, um, the Carnegie Foundation uh, for providing um, financial support um, and support for the program on U.S.-Russian relations in general. A quick few words about how we will organize today's um, uh, today's session. I will introduce each speaker. Um, each speaker will speak uh, for about 15 or 20 minutes. And at the end of um, each speaker's presentation, we will have a question and answer session. And I will ask attendees to please write your questions in the Q&A box, and then uh, we'll have a chance to answer them uh, at the end of the formal presentations. Um, okay, and with that, I am happy to introduce our first speaker, who is Jeffrey Mainkoff. Um, <clears throat> Jeff is Distinguished Research Fellow at U.S. National Defense University's Institute for National Strategic Studies. He is the author of Russian Foreign Policy, The Return of Great Power Politics, a book that many of us, us have used in teaching uh, Russian politics in our Russian politics courses. Uh, he has a forthcoming book, which I think is uh, recently published, Empires of Eurasia, How Imperial Legacies Shape International Security, uh, published by Yale University Press. Congratulations on that book. And the book examines the impact of the imperial past on Chinese, Iranian, Russian, and Turkish politics and foreign policy. Jeff also writes frequently for Foreign Affairs, War on the Rocks, CNN, and other outlets. He previously was a senior fellow with the Russia and Eurasia program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And he has served as an advisor on US-Russian relations at the State Department as a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow. Okay, um, and with that, I will turn over the floor to Jeffrey Mankoff. Okay, thank you very much, Elise. Thanks to uh, the Harriman Institute for sponsoring this event and to all of you for joining us today. Um, the war in Ukraine has really trained a light on Turkey's role in the region, including its relationships with both Russia and Ukraine. Um, of course, we're focusing on that relationship with Russia today. Uh, and we can see in the course of this war that Turkey is playing something of an equivocal role. Uh, on the one hand, it is providing significant military support for Ukraine, primarily in the form of uh, drones that have been used to quite good effect uh, to target Russian forces, not just in Ukraine, but in other regions of the world as well. Um, and it's pushing for mediation. It's been one of the key players uh, in trying to negotiate a settlement between Moscow and Kiev. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, has not joined in sanctions. Uh, has welcomed uh, a number of Russian businesses and Russian oligarchs uh, who have been turned away from uh, ports in the United States and in Europe uh, as a result of sanctions, uh, is benefiting from uh, the financial windfall in some ways that comes from that. Uh, so Turkey uh, is very supportive uh, of Ukraine, but at the same time is trying very hard not to sunder its relationship with Russia. Uh, there's this kind of competitive cooperation that's emerged uh, between Ankara and Moscow over the course of the last several years, and that seems to be playing out once again here in Ukraine. Indeed, that model of competitive cooperation uh, is one that has deep historical roots uh, that in some ways go back to the first days uh, when the then Russian Empire and Ottoman Empire uh, first began to interact. That interaction goes back to the 17th century um, and has seen the two countries or their imperial predecessors engage in a long series of conflicts. Uh, usually those are conflicts that the Russian side won. 
And as a result uh, of those conflicts, a couple of things happened. Uh, one, in Turkish strategic culture, there emerged a very strong uh, respect for and fear of Russian military power, which also translated into the search for uh, Western allies uh, in order to counterbalance uh, Russia's military preponderance. And we've saw we've seen that um, going back to the 19th century, uh, the Crimean War, uh, the First World War, when Turkey partnered with Imperial Germany, and we've seen it in the modern era, uh, Turkey's membership in NATO. Now this competitive uh, relationship largely focused on the borderlands, on areas between the core areas uh, of the Russian and Ottoman empires, that is places like the Balkans, uh, the South Caucasus, uh, and to some degree, the Middle East and Central Asia. Um, in all of these areas, there was uh, a longstanding struggle uh, for influence. The dynamic changed quite substantially after the First World War, though, and it changed in part because the old empires collapsed. In Turkey, you had efforts under Ataturk to create a nation state within clearly defined borders, uh, which in part entailed uh, severing some of the links that had tied uh, the center to these uh, peripheral areas in, in the South Caucasus, the Balkans, uh, and elsewhere. And it was also because uh, with the consolidation of Soviet rule over Central Asia and the Caucasus, there was less opportunity uh, for foreign intervention in these regions. And so after the First World War, even though you had very serious ideological differences between the Turkish Republic and the Soviet Union, there was this kind of pragmatic cooperation. And you saw it in Soviet help uh, with Turkish industrialization that begins uh, even in the 1920s and 1930s and extends uh, after the Second World War uh, as well. Now, when uh, pressure over the borderlands reemerges, uh, it becomes a source of competition uh, once again. And you can see this uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War, where Stalin uh, decides to put pressure on Turkey for the stationing uh, of Soviet forces on the Straits and potentially uh, in Eastern Anatolia uh, as well. And this is the driving force that leads uh, Turkey to apply for and ultimately achieve NATO membership uh, in 1952. Even after Turkey becomes a NATO member though, uh, it does uh, now from the position of strength that NATO membership uh, provides, continue to engage with Moscow uh, in various ways, at times in ways that put it at odds uh, with some of its NATO allies. Um, and we can see this, uh, for instance, after the uh, occupation of Northern Cyprus, where there's uh, an arms embargo that's in place on Turkey uh, by the United States and some of its allies, where there's a very conscious effort to try and uh, compensate for the tensions in, in relations with Western partners by uh, cultivating uh, closer relations with Moscow. Now, when the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, suddenly some of these borderland areas that had traditionally been the focal point for competition between the Russian, Soviet, and Turkish Ottoman states reemerge. Um, and from the late 1980s, early 1990s, you again see uh, a more competitive dynamic emerging uh, in especially the South Caucasus, but in some of the other uh, regions of the former Soviet Union uh, as well. In part, this is connected to political shifts that are going on uh, inside Turkey, where you have uh, a new generation of leadership coming to power. This begins with Turgut Özal uh, in the mid 1980s, uh, who's a, a moderate Islamist who has uh, roots in uh, the Islamist opposition to the traditional Kemalist elite, it has this view of Turkey as a regional power that shares a common post-Ottoman history uh, with some of the other uh, states in the region. Um, at the same time that Soviet power is eroding, uh, suddenly uh, there are new opportunities for Turkey to engage uh, in places like the South Caucasus uh, and also Central Asia. Um, and so you have this more competitive dynamic. And it lasts really uh, through the 1990s. There's tension over uh, Russia's relationship to the PKK, uh, Turkey's involvement uh, with the various separatist groups in the North Caucasus uh, in the war in Chechnya. But around the turn of the 21st century, uh, there's uh, a conscious effort on the part of leadership in both countries to resolve some of these tensions and again, focus on cooperation. And it does involve kind of a trade-off where Turkey issues support for the Chechen separatists, uh, Russia backs away from its support for the PKK. Uh, and in 2001, there's the signing uh, of a uh, Eurasian Cooperation Action Plan between the two countries that focuses on um, looking for areas of mutual adv advantage uh, in the former Soviet region. In this period, uh, there's a deepening of the economic relationship. 
Uh, you have uh, new energy developments, including the construction of pipelines, bringing Russian gas to Turkey, uh, the emergence of Russia as an important market for Turkish companies, uh, construction companies for agricultural exports, uh, and as a source of tourists uh, who come to uh, especially Turkey's uh, beach resorts in the south. Strategically, uh, Turkey in this period also begins turning to Russia as a hedge uh, against the West at a time when tensions with the US and some of the other NATO allies are becoming quite serious again. You can see this in 2003 with the Iraq war, uh, with the slowing and then the eventual uh, de facto freezing of, of Turkey's uh, path towards EU membership. Um, and then in a much more serious way, from the middle of the past decade, uh, where U.S. support for the Syrian PKK, the Syrian branch of the PKK, uh, the YPG, becomes a major irritant in bilateral relations, and where the perception that the United States played a somewhat equivocal role uh, in opposing the 2016 coup attempt uh, leads to a very conscious policy in Ankara of trying to use Russia uh, as a hedge, as a way of gaining more leverage in its relationship uh, with the West. Now, in the United States, and I think in some European countries as well, there's a perception that this pivot uh, was actually about Turkey moving away from the West. It was about Turkey trying to become a sort of ally uh, of Russia. And I don't think that that was ever the case, but it really was uh, about positioning Turkey as a more autonomous, independent player internationally, using this relationship with Russia as a hedge. And this is something that actually we've seen a lot of other uh, US allies do uh, in the post Arab Spring era, whether that's Saudi Arabia, whether that's Egypt uh, or others who have all kind of turned to Russia uh, as a hedge, uh, seeking to deepen economic and in some ways uh, security cooperation with them as well. Now that was all well and good, except uh, during the same period, the strategic competition between Turkey and Russia over these areas in between, uh, once again, uh, becomes really pronounced. Uh, we saw it in Syria, we saw it in Libya, and we saw it most recently uh, in the South Caucasus. In each of these areas, Turkey and Russia end up backing different sides. Uh, they have different strategic orientations. They wanna see different outcomes. Nevertheless, the leadership in both countries has sought to compartmentalize those differences, even when uh, they found themselves uh, engaged in direct hostilities, which has been particularly the case uh, in Syria. Um, both see an advantage uh, in having this kind of competitive cooperation. Uh, for Turkey, again, Russia provides a hedge, it provides additional leverage uh, in terms of its relationship with its Western partners. And for Russia, having a Turkey that is more independently oriented rather than a fully consolidated member of the West comes with its own set of advantages as well. Nevertheless, this is a very dynamic and sometimes unstable uh, kind of cooperation. This instability um, is uh, particularly relevant in the context of Ukraine, uh, an area where there is large scale uh, military combat, where Russia uh, has staked quite a bit uh, on achieving military victory, uh, and where Turkey, for all of its equivocation, has largely lined up on the other side. Um, it's an open question, uh, I think, what role Turkey will ultimately play in this conflict. Uh, so far, again, it has been trying to hedge, uh, providing concrete support for Ukraine uh, in terms, in, in, in the form of uh, these Turkish produced drones, which incidentally, it's not only providing, but in the run up to the war, signed an agreement with the Ukrainian government for uh, establishing production facilities for drones. Uh, in Ukrainian territory uh, for working uh, with the Ukrainian Navy uh, on modernization uh, and on training uh, in various other ways as well. Nevertheless, uh, this cooperation has been kept relatively quiet. It's not something that Turkey is eager to uh, promote in public. Uh, the official line is that the drones that are being supplied to Ukraine are being done on a private basis uh, by the company that produces them uh, on a private contract that it's not government policy. Uh, of course, this couldn't happen without the, the direct involvement and support of the Turkish government. So that's slightly uh, disingenuous, but nevertheless, it's part of, the, of the, the message that Ankara wants to send. But at the same time, uh, as we said before, uh, Turkey has not uh, implemented unilateral sanctions against Russia. As a non-EU member, it's not required to follow EU sanctions. It's kept its airspace uh, open to uh, Russian planes in a way that uh, the United States and European uh, partners have pressed it to end. Um, and it has welcomed uh, oligarchs and others who are sanctioned uh, in the West. Uh, a number of uh, Russian oligarchs whose yachts are being sought uh, for freezing or confiscation by the US and its European allies have taken up 
uh, temporary residents in Turkish ports. Uh, and the Turkish government seems perfectly happy to benefit from uh, the outflow of Russian assets uh, and Russian business people uh, from the West, welcoming them uh, to Turkey. Whether this balancing act will be sustainable over the longer term, of course, will depend to a great degree what happens on the ground. Um, I think Turkey is waiting to see what ultimately happens. Uh, if Russia is substantially weakened, if the war ends up going badly, uh, or if Russia becomes more aggressive regionally, I think there's a prospect for Turkey making a more decisive kind of pivot back towards the West and away from Russia. But the converse is true as well. One way or another, I think this idea of Turkey as a pivot state, as a country that has interests that are not solely concentrated in Europe, but that is actually trying to um, position itself between the different major blocks and trying to establish greater influence in its region is something that we're going to have to get used to. And that's going to endure for the foreseeable future, regardless of what happens in Turkish domestic politics, which is a whole other question that we can talk about in the Q&A. And we'll stop there. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jeff. That was great. Um, okay, so now I would like to turn to the next speaker, who is Professor Evren Balta. She's a professor of international relations at Ozygen University in Istanbul. She's the author of The American Passport in Turkey, National Citizenship in the Age of Transnationalism, published in 2020 by Penn Press. This book was the winner of the American Sociological Association Global and Transnational Sociology Section's Best Book by an International Scholar Award. And Professor Balta's research includes transnational identities, populism, and domestic sources of international relations. She's published extensively on Turkish foreign policy and Russian-Turkish relations. Evren? Uh, thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, almost two decades ago, I was a student at Columbia University, so I'm really delighted to be back here, um, even though it's over Zoom, uh, as a presenter. And uh, I am going to be repeating some of the uh, insights uh, of our first speaker, uh, and I am going to be sharing uh, my slides with you. Uh, let me do that first. Um, so so I think you can, I have to buy stars. So, okay, here it is. Uh, so I'll be talking more about the Turkey's uh, rapprochement with Russia in the last six years and uh, the competitive cooperation between Turkey and Russia as, um, as we uh, said in the beginning of this presentation in this panel has been intensified in the last six years. And the question that I'm asking is that what compelled Turkey to reach out Russia? What were the factors mainly affected this relationship to evolve? And the answer that I'm having is basically um, look, I mean, I'm trying to look at to the economic factors, the energy relationship, energy interdependence Turkey and Russia has, and also security cooperation. And, and uh, we also need to look at the normative factors that affects and that shapes this relationship. When we look at the economic factors, what we do see is that uh, Russia is the number one import partner in 19, uh, 2019 um, uh, of Turkey, uh, but it began to decrease. I mean, uh, the, the trade relationship between Russia and Turkey uh, uh, began to decrease uh, starting from uh, 2019, and Russia became, uh, became the number 10th export partner of Turkey in 2020. Um, but what is very important in this economic relationship between Turkey and Russia uh, is that uh, Russia is the number one partner of Turkey's construction sector, and Turkey's economic development model is basically revolves around in the last two decades under the AKP government, specifically in the construction sector. Even though Russia is not the major economic partner of Turkey, uh, being the number one construction partner of Turkey is a very important component of Turkey's development policy. And in terms of the tourism sector, uh, Russia is the number one partner of Turkey. It's the top tourist sending country to Turkey. Uh, so so um, that is an also important component of Turkey's economic relationship between um, uh, economic relationship with Russia. 
And Turkey already experienced the problems of sanctions on its economy in 2015. If you remember, Turkey down the Russian jet uh, in uh, Turkey uh, Syria border in 2015, and Russia uh, uh, and and Russia imposed sanctions on Turkey for a year or so, and the trade between the two countries dropped from. 38 billion to 8 billion in a year, and which really uh, had a huge economic consequences on Turkey's economy. So Turkey had already this sanction aversion and knowing that what the sanctions uh, either coming from Russia or towards Russia can do to the Turkish economy. And we need to keep in mind that Turkish economy right now is already going through a very harsh economic crisis in the last two years, a very high inflationary period, uh, rising prices and all this. So the second component of Turkey's relationship is about the energy. Uh, and uh, similar to many European countries, Turkey has an energy de interdependence on um, Russia. 50% of Turkey's natural gas is coming from uh, Russia, 24% of it is oil, and 40% of its coal is basically Russian coal, Russian oil, Russian natural gas. So Turkey is dependent in terms of its energy on Russia. Turkey, but on the other side, Turkey is also the Russia's second biggest, biggest gas client after Germany. Uh, so not only Russia, uh, Turkey is dependent on um, uh, Russian natural gas, but also Russia is dependent on Turkey as the consumer of its natural gas. So here you can also see the interdependence between Turkey and Russia. As after the Ukrainian conflict, what we have been uh, experiencing but not just even after the Ukrainian conflict, we began to talk about energy diversification in Turkey more after the crisis, after the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia. Uh, but in the last three or four years, um, the energy diversification has already been um, um, a, a, uh, on the on the table um, of Turkey, um, uh, the Turkish policymakers have been talking about shifting to more to LNG. Um, uh, the nuclear is also on the table, but we need to keep in mind that Turkey is only. Uh, nuclear plant, the Akkuyu nuclear plant, is basically uh, planned to be built through the investment credits by Russian banks, which are currently being under sanctions. So that also puts uh, Turkey's energy diversification plans, which was not, um, 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 I mean, uh, puts energy diversification plans um, uh, in a dire situation as well. But there are also more components of energy diversification, like more cooperation in the East Mat. And we have been seeing improvements in Turkish-Greek relations, Turkish-Israeli relations. And this is also a consequence of uh, the Ukrainian cri uh, crisis. And uh, there is also um, a a lot of talk about accelerating Turkey's shift to the climate-friendly energy resources as a result of, again, uh, the Russian invasion of um, Ukraine. What we are also be, uh, seeing, experiencing in the last period as, uh, is the fact that the rising energy prices favors Turkey's regional competitors like Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates, and this is giving um, and this is, again, a problem for Turkey's um, geopolitical ambitions as well. Energy is not about um, natural gas, but it's also about energy transportation. And uh, Turkey uh, has been, um, uh, I mean, the... the, the, the uh, what Turkey has been trying to do is to make, to turn itself an energy hub uh, since 2014 in the last decade or so. Um, this is very different from Turkey's position from 1990s. I mean, back in the 1990s, Turkey was also trying to make itself as a hub, but then uh, Turkey's positioning was basically against Russia and trying to take an active role in projects aiming to bypass Russian-controlled transportation lines. But in the 2000s, this 
line or this position of Turkey has changed a little bit. And Turkey's attitude towards transport routes became more inclusive of Russian interests. And this inclusiveness is basically related to the fact that the European position or the transatlantic position towards Russian energy has also changed and became more inclusive of Russian interests. And thus the Turkish interests have also evolved. Um, the energy transportation is very politically motivated. Uh, how energy transportation is done is also very politically motivated. Uh, for Russia, it's basically, we know that for Turk Stream, uh, for Nord Stream 2, uh, it's bypassing Ukraine in delivering gas to Europe. So Turkey has collaborated, Russia, I mean, Russia has collaborated with Turkey uh, for this, uh, keeping this geopolitical aim in mind. And for Turkey, as I said, it was basically to become a hub for European energy markets. And the end result uh, of that would be to increase Turkey's bargaining power in Europe and um, politically as well. Um, this is one part of the relationship. I mean, in order to understand Turkish-Russian relationship, we really need to first look at this economic interdependence and energy interdependence as in the other cases of Europe as well. But the second component of Turkish-Russian relationship is basically security cooperation. And that cooperation is a competitive, has a competitive dynamic as well. And what we have been experiencing in the six years is that an intense cooperation and these two actors becoming order setting actors basically in the Middle East, Central Asia, Caucasus, North Africa. Uh, they're cooperating, uh, working together, but there is um, also a competitive dynamic in this relationship as well. But the most no notable relationship, um, the most intense relationship that these two actors have developed in the last six years has been in two areas specifically. Uh, it was in Syria and also in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, they have joint peace uh, forces or the joint peacekeeping arrangements. Uh, Russia's role is more in this joint peacekeeping process, uh, but Turkey has an active role as well. In Syria, we all do know that uh, they are uh, partners in Astana process, including Iran, and they sort of created an order, a managed conflict in Syria together. And as a result of this process, they learned to work together. Uh, let me go um, over a little bit of the context of the cooperation. Uh, this cooperation has been happening in the lack of an order setting actor in the region. Uh, what I mean by that, it happens in the context of vestlessness or the American retrenchment. And this is really, this really goes into how these two actors pursue uh, both the region and the global politics. In the last decade or so, specifically after the Arab Spring in 2015, they began to experience or um, um, and see the world, pursue the world in a context um, of uh, being alone or being um, left out. So um, uh, as I said, uh, that uh, really created a cooperative dynamic um, in, between these two actors. The second important context of cooperation is their threat perception. Their threat perception is very different. These two actors have um, significantly different threat perceptions, but they need each other in terms of um, in, in, in terms of um, how to uh, child, I mean, how, how to deal with these different threats emerging um, in the region. For Turkey, the major threat is Kurdish transnationalism, and uh, the Kurdish transnationalism as an ex existential threat uh, basically increased after uh, US cooperation with the PYD in Syria and cooperation with Russia really enabled Turkey to become more active in Syria. For Russia, it's Islamic, how was and it was and still is Islamic transnationalism and cooperation with Turkey enabled Russia uh, to keep the uh, Syrian opposition uh, in check. In specifically in Syria as well. So their threat perceptions differ, but they needed each other. Each other. Uh, the second component of the context of cooperation is the balancing act. Um, so uh, this is most important, more important, in fact, for Turkey. 
what Turkey has been trying to do in its foreign policy in the last 10 years, in the last decade, is to follow a balance, a balance of power politics. And what I mean by that, um, Turkey is trying to balance Russia, which Russia is very strong in, in, in the Black Sea. Uh, so Turkey ties to balance Russia in the Black Sea. It cooperates and coordinates with Ukraine, cooperates and coordinates with NATO in the Black Sea. Uh, but also it tries to balance the U.S. interests in the Middle East by cooperating with Russia. So it's basically, I mean, uh, a, a Turkey, I mean, a balancing act in Turkish foreign policy. Uh, this balancing act also enabled Turkey to all of um, Turkey tried to overcome uh, some conditionalities uh, that were posed by its allies over Turkey, uh, and it's specifically when it comes to arms purchases, and we need to understand the S-400 deal in the context of these conditionalities and its balancing act. And one final component of security cooperation is the Omnibalancing Act. And again, Omnibalancing Act is basically referring to protecting not the state or national interests of Turkey, but the interests of the regime. And Turkey began to understand, uh, or um, I mean, after 2016 coup attempt, Turkey's regime, Erdogan's regime, really perceived that this coup attempt is basically um, a, a threat, a direct threat to its regime stability, and it wouldn't get the much needed cooperation from its Western allies. Uh, so Russia was seen as an important component of its regime stability and regime security. Uh, there are institutional and normative aspects of Turkish-Russian cooperation. It's not an alliance, it's an alignment. Um, it's not a shift of access, but it is a very flexible foreign policy. It's not institutionalized as in Turkey's relationship to NATO or EU or in general to the transatlantic alliance. And in fact, both actors basically argue that alliances formed by or marked by formal defense treaties and mutual commitments are no longer offering solution to the immediate security threats of the parties. So they are going after more flexible alliances, uh, which um, are not institutionalized and which are backed by the similarity of their decision-making processes. So in order to understand this um, rapprochement or this alignment uh, between this, these two countries, we need to look at the similarity of decision-making processes, uh, which is again a direct consequences of uh, personalized uh, regime type. Uh, these two leaders understand each other. They know that uh, their decisions will not be reversed in congresses and parliaments. Uh, so they keep their promises. They are um, men of their words and this and that. And they, again, share a very similar worldview, uh, specifically these two governments. This is changing right now, uh, That, uh, but uh, basically I can frame it as, um, um, as something like that. We are living in a post-Western world. Um, the global politics is changing and this and that. I think this is one of the major components what is being changed um, after the Ukrainian um, crisis specifically uh, for Turkey. Um, and this balancing act and the relationship between both uh, with all these actors uh, really uh, characterize or shape Turkey's response to the war in Ukraine. Um, as we discussed, uh, Turkey supports uh, Ukraine with arms supplies, drones, no sanctions on Russia. Uh, but this is the same policy after the Crimean invasion in 2014. Um, uh, Turkey said that even back then, uh, it only uh, backs up UN mandated sanctions. No other sanctions are supported. This is official Turkey's, uh, Turkey's official sanction policy. Uh, Turkey tries to place a mediator role between Russia and Ukraine. It implements the Montreal Convention in a way not to alienate Russia, 
and Ukraine and Transatlantic Alliance. Uh, it's involved, uh, uh, but very indirectly involved in the efforts to build NATO defenses in the Southeastern Euro Europe, may become more directly involved uh, in NATO's forward presence if the war goes on. And it's tried, I mean, Turkey also tries to seek potential opportunities or profits from the situation. Uh, and some of the things that are discussed by the Turkey's policymakers are how to attract foreign direct investment, which is withdrawing from Russia, how to attract Russian political and economic exiles, thus the oligarch debate really fits in here, uh, how to build the, fill the void created by the drawdown of Russian military forces from the Middle East and Caucasus, uh, how to reset ties with the EU and NATO as an essential partner. Finally, I think four factors informs Turkey's response to the war in Ukraine, um, and also um, not just Turkey's response, these four factors are very important in shaping different countries' diverging responses to the war in Ukraine. And some of them I tried to touch upon in my talk. Uh, the first is energy dependence and economic fragility, uh, dependence on Russian economic gas, uh, Russian gas and economic um, crisis really reduces the likelihood of a uh, firm stance uh, towards Russia. Uh, but it is not just that. Public opinion also matters a lot. Um, Anti-Vastinism has become one of the main fault lines of political competition in Turkey, and it's very strong. Anti-Americanism in Turkey is also very strong. And you see a lot of pro-Russian views and, and, and views questioning the Western sanctions or the Western response to the Ukrainian cr uh, crisis. Uh, prior alliance patterns also matters a lot. As I said, Turkey's NATO membership, Turkey's membership to the uh, Transatlantic Security Alliance really shaped Turkey's response, but also Turkey's relationship to evolving relationship and security cooperation to Russia shaped its response uh, as well. And finally, I think the most important factor that shapes the response to the war in Ukraine uh, is the alliance rigidity or the alliance resilience, whatever we call um, uh, the most important component or the shaping determining factor of Turkey's response um, to the war, um, I mean, or in general, Turkey's foreign policy was that Turkey's autonomy was basically tolerated by the transatlantic alliance for various reasons, uh, for immigration, uh, for um, not having having enough capacity or this and that, or having fractions within the transatlantic um, um, alliance itself, uh, really shaped uh, this alliance rigidity in a way. And um, the question right now, after the Russian um, invasion of Ukraine, after the war in Ukraine, whether the transatlantic alliance will tolerate this autonomy. And if so, which in which areas this autonomy will be tolerated? Um, and what I can see is that security and military cooperation will less likely to be tolerated, so, uh, such as s 4 uh, Turkey needs to find a solution to its s 4 problem because it really requires a, an intense security cooperation between uh, Turkey and Russia. Uh, but economic and energy cooperation more likely to be tolerated, but that also depends on how the war evolves. And we'll see that. We'll see a lot of compartmentalization uh, within the transatlantic alliance as well, or we may not see that. This is something that is being shaped as the war goes on. And uh, also uh, one other important question is that, what about democracy, whether the uh, undemocratic, non-democratic countries, our, our personalized regimes will be tolerated or not, whether they'll be seen as all allies and partners. That will be an important question for Turkey to answer and for the transatlantic alliance uh, to answer as well. So I'll stop here and, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer in the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Evren. And now we will turn to our last speaker, Michael Reynolds, who is an associate professor of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University and the author of Shattering Empires, The Clash and Collapse of the Ottoman and Russian Empires, published by Cambridge University Press in 2011. The book was a co-winner of the American Historical Association's George Lewis Beer Prize. Also, it was a Financial Times Book of the Summer and a choice outstanding title. <clears throat> 
Professor Reynolds's research areas include Ottoman and modern Middle Eastern history, Russian and Eurasian history, mm. the Caucasus, international relations, empire, nationalism, Turkish foreign policy, and US foreign policy. Michael? <clears throat> muted myself, obviously. Thank you, Elise, for, for the introduction. And also thank you to the Harriman and Sabanji Centers for sponsoring this talk. I actually got my start in graduate school at Columbia at, in the Harriman uh, Institute. So it's uh, nice to be back, even if uh, virtually. Um, thank you also to Jeff and Vren for doing such a wonderful job, um, very thorough job of covering so much about uh, Turkish and Russian relations. It makes my task that much easier. Uh, let me apologize also for the sort of bland background that I have and the uh, lighting that's uh, rather off. Um, I, I can't blame this on the war. I was on sabbatical in Moscow at the beginning of uh, this year, but thanks to the war, I had to re relocate uh, to Baku. Um, or I'm sitting in an apartment is nice, but not with the best lighting or the most interesting uh, uh, background. Um, in thinking about Turkish-Russian -Rus relations right now, um, what comes to my mind are, I think the, the utility maybe of thinking about two or, or maybe three contending narratives uh, about the war. Uh, that influence Turkish perspectives, uh, not just Turkish perspectives, but I think in order to understand the Turkish perspective, it's useful to step back and think about uh, these narratives. I said they're contending narratives, although they're not mutually uh, incompatible. The first one, and this is the one that's really, I think, predominant uh, in the United States and in the West, and that's the argument this war is effectively, is really at, at its essence a war about uh, Russian imperialism, uh, that Russia is engaged in the war of aggression um, due to its imperial ambitions and its refusal to recognize Ukrainian sovereignty uh, and uh, nationhood. Uh, and you know, the sources of you know, people might differ, and of course, where the sources of the imperialism is it simply is it in Putin's head, is it something in post-Soviet society, or in fact, does it stretch um, deeper in Russian either history or culture, uh, strategic culture, um, etc. But you know, the basic idea of this narrative is that this is really, again, it comes, boils down to uh, it's Russia's imperial ambitions and its uh, unwillingness to reconcile those ambitions with Ukrainian sovereignty and statehood and nationhood, I might add as well. Uh, there's excellent support for this uh, uh, <clears throat> for this uh, narrative. I would just say anyone, uh, I would advise anyone interested in this war, if they have not read to read, have not read what Vladimir Putin himself wrote about Ukraine in 2021. You can find it on the Kremlin web website. And he quite explicitly says that uh, Ukraine really isn't a, or shouldn't be a sovereign state. And then the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians are not really a, uh, a separate nation from Russians. Uh, and he's also made uh, those comments also offhand uh, to various heads of state and diplomats uh, in the years building up to this war. So um, in addition to there's another narrative that uh, and one finds this not I mean, it's all over the all over the world, but a bit more one will find this uh, in Turkey. And that is a narrative that says it really this war is at least as much, if not more, it's about U.S. hegemony. And uh, according to this narrative, really, this conflict has been one that's been brewing from 2014 with the change in government in Ukraine and then the uh, Russia's response to that by seizing Crimea, or some would push it back to 2008 when uh, NATO, uh, pushed by the United States, declared that uh, Georgia and Ukraine would become members of NATO, or one could say 2007, when Putin sort of effectively you know, drew, drew a red line and warned that he was not happy with the way the United States was running uh, the, the global order, it's not just its relations with Russia, but more generally, but including its uh, NATO expansion. Or again, people would push this back to 97, uh, with the first round of expansions to NATO, or even 1991. Uh, and according to this narrative, the US, regardless of when, where, one, when, where one wants to start, uh, says where this conflict begins, the US has repeatedly asserted itself and consistently said to Russia that you either comply with what comply with we our demands, and then we can talk. Uh, and has not been, the United States has not been very responsive to Russian uh, concerns. And again, to the contrary, has really uh, 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 been uh, uh, quite dismissive uh, of Russian uh, demands. And others would see this as a pattern the United States has played uh, around the world. Uh, then, in, again, in support of this, uh, uh, people would point to 
uh, the fact that uh, you know this war was no surprise to anyone. The U.S. knew very well that Ukraine and NATO expansion in Ukraine was a sore spot for uh, for the Russians uh, more generally, not just for Putin. It was, of course, a red line sp- explicitly. That's what our current director of the CIA had warned when he was ambassador uh, to Russia. Said there was a red line not just for Putin but for Russian society more broadly. Uh, Robert Gates. Uh, Secretary of Defense under Barack Obama, and then prior to that, Secretary of Defense under uh, George Bush, and also former director of the CIA and uh, old Soviet and Russia expert himself, wrote wrote in his memoirs that the uh, decision to declare that uh, Georgia and Ukraine, um, specifically, particularly, I should say, uh, Ukraine, uh, bringing those into NATO that uh, George Bush had backed was, in in Gates's word, a monumental uh, provocation. Uh, and then again, uh, prior to that, you had people such as uh, <clears throat> George Kennan, uh, Richard Pipes, uh, and a number of uh, other, some 40 something experts on American foreign policy, including uh, multiple experts on uh, Russian and Soviet affairs, had warned that the expansion of NATO eastward, not even uh, NATO, excuse me, not even uh, Ukraine necessarily, but simply the expansion of NATO eastward was going to be. Uh, in, in Kennan's word, and the, those who signed this letter, the biggest blunder of American foreign policy in the post-Cold uh, War uh, era. Um, and again, these, uh, those who subscribe to this view may argue that you, the Ukraine war is, is effectively, it's a, a, a proxy war the United States has used to sort of lure, or trap, uh, and bleed Russia in Ukraine with the hope of bringing the downfall of Putin and uh, his uh, regime. Um, and likewise, you know, this is a war, a crisis that the United States has used to its own benefit. It's na- by enabling it to effectively um, rally or subordinate uh, uh, Western Europe as well as its allies, Japan, uh, South Korea, and Taiwan, uh, to bring it closer to the United States, which is both useful against Russia, and then the possibility of a, a conflict coming down the line uh, with China. And um, and again, those the, those two, they're often seen as competing uh, narratives. They don't have to necessarily be, uh, uh, they're not necess- uh, mutually uh, exclusive. There's a third narrative um, that, that is sort of the, really this is a war about uh, democracy. In my opinion, it's probably the weakest of these uh, primarily because uh, for a number of reasons. One, you know, I don't think Vladimir Putin's really presented a comprehensive critique of uh, democracy as such. He himself actually pretends to hold elections. Uh, he has produced a critique of sorts of uh, liberalism, uh, but not uh, so much uh, democracy. But more importantly, I'd say there's nothing like an Iron Curtain, in, or at least there wasn't until the beginning of this war, anything remotely like the Iron Curtain, or uh, and there is nothing that Russia, contemporary Russia was nothing like uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, Russians, unlike in the Soviet period, uh, today are free to travel, and by and large, I would say had fairly uh, good access to the outside information uh, and uh, to the world. So the idea is sort of that the, the notion that a democracy in Ukraine would somehow destabilize Russia and that this is what's driving Putin. I, I don't find that uh, credible really in the least. In addition to that one can point out the fact that Ukraine itself, its own uh, democratic credentials uh, were quite limited and uh, also nor does Ukraine really present any sort of an economic uh, model or uh, any, in any way, this, the Ukraine does not offer, did not offer to Russians a, an appealing model of what their politics and economy uh, could be. Uh, also, in addition, I point to the, in the geopolitics, global geopolitics of this conflict is the absence of India on the American side. It's sort of India, perhaps somewhat like Turkey, has been straddling things, uh, which, is, which is interesting because India, of course, is the world's largest democracy. And it also, like the United States, has deep concerns about China and the United States has been invested over the course of the past decade or more in wooing India, uh, but yet India has not been as uh, quick uh, or as enthusiastic about supporting the United States uh, and the West in this conflict. Um, so let me come back to those uh, two narratives. One can see those, both of those at work uh, in Turkey. And as Evren mentioned, there's a good deal of skepticism um, in Turkey about uh, uh, NATO. Um, but perhaps before I comment on that, let me talk about the, the, the question of Russian imperialism, because that's oftentimes people think about Russia, and Jeff touched on this and Evren touched on this. This is the first thing that uh, leaps to uh, people's 
uh, minds to think, okay, isn't uh, Turkey historically been uh, a rival of the Russian Empire and oftentimes a victim? And that's absolutely the case, depending upon how one counts them. Uh, Russian, uh, the Ottoman Empire fought over 10 wars. 12 or 13, and the majority of those, the great majority of those, uh, the Ottoman Empire lost, and as Jeff mentioned, this sort of bred within Turkey a healthy uh, respect uh, for Russian uh, military power. Let me, uh, just, uh, rather than try to, again, cover that ground, let me just uh, talk about uh, Ukraine in particular and how the uh, Ottomans have seen that historically. Uh, <clears throat> 1918, when Ukraine was not contrary, I think Putin writes that Ukraine was a creation of Vladimir Lenin. Actually, one could say the Ukrainian statehood was a creation of uh, German uh, of the Germans in 1918. Uh, and that's not to say Ukrainian nationhood is, that's a separate question. But the Ukrainian state first uh, received uh, independence in 1918, was recognized at the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, and that came with very powerful uh, push from Germany. But supporting the Germans in this were the Ottomans, who of course were fighting with the Germans uh, in World War I. And they were very enthusiastic when the idea of the possibility was raised by the Germans of recognizing uh, Ukraine as an independent state. The Ottomans were uh, very enthusiastic about this. In fact, at the beginning of World War I, and even indeed prior to the Ottoman entry into the war, the Ottomans already began working with a group called the Union for the Liberation of Ukraine, which is sort of an exile group uh, that had been advocating for an independent Ukraine uh, and prior to, uh, again, the Ottoman entry into the war, they began exploring the possibility of working with this group uh, against the Russians due to the military course of the war and the fact that the Ottomans found themselves on the defensive uh, throughout the war. That was, they did not do too much with the uh, Union for the Liberation of Ukraine until again, 1918 in January, when thanks to the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, in um, um, November of 1917, when Russia fell into civil war, it looked like, in fact, the empire is falling apart. There is a possibility of an independent Ukraine. Uh, the Ottomans uh, re-energized their contacts uh, with this group. And as uh, Ottoman military intelligence wrote that if we can break Ukraine from Russia, this will deliver a crippling blow to Russian power. And it would be the best thing that we, that we could get out of this war. And the Ukraine would be far more important than any Muslim areas uh, in the Russian empire. And although they were skeptical about the possibility of being able to, uh, um, uh, uh, to affect, to achieve a break of Ukraine from Russia, they thought it was definitely something uh, worth supporting. And then in the course of negotiations at brussels toss, this in fact did become uh, not just a possibility, but reality and Ukraine was recognized as an independent state. The Ottomans were uh, quite happy to receive uh, later in uh, 1918, uh, in the fall, the first ambassador of an independent Ukraine and the Ottoman newspapers pointed to the great irony of the fact that here they were welcoming uh, an ambassador from an independent Ukrainian state when in 1914, the ambassador of Russia, of the Russian empire had left with the prediction that he was going, when he returned, he would be returning to a Russian city. Uh, and so the Ottomans yeah, so it took a great deal of uh, satisfaction in the, in, in the way that uh, history turned out differently than what the Russians had expected. Uh, I might mention here a lot of people when they think about Turkey and Ukraine uh, and Russia think about Crimea, which had been uh, a part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, let me just say in 1918, the Ottomans were uh, supportive of the idea of Crimea perhaps achieving independence, but also made the, the decision, we will not back this if it contradicts, if it anyways undermines uh, Ukrainian independence. So the point being here that even in 1918, uh, the Ottomans had a very uh, shrewd, I would say, uh, geopolitical perspective on uh, their northern uh, uh, frontier. Likewise, I think, you know, Turkey today, uh, again, as uh, both Jeff and Evren uh, have pointed out, uh, it is quite conscious of the fact that sitting to its north is still Russia, a considerable power. Moreover, we see in, in Ukraine, it's a power, well, I should say, I was going to say a power that's willing to use force, but Turkey knows very well that Russia's uh, willing to use force as a clash with Russia and Ukraine and has been engaged in the proxy war of sorts uh, in Libya. And then a very curious I once suppose could call the competitive relationship uh, in uh, the Caucasus and all of those areas, the Caucasus, Syria and Libya have involved a military dimension uh, to Turkish uh, Russian uh, relations and Turkey currently finds itself pulling a, a very interesting balancing act where again is uh, uh, both uh, Jeff and Evren have uh, uh, pointed out where it's doing things such as selling arms to Ukraine, arms, the drones that have been quite effective in this war as they've been elsewhere uh, in Libya and in uh, the Caucasus. 
And yet at the same time, it's not imposing sanctions on Russia. Uh, Russians can travel to Turkey. Many have left Russia to come to Turkey, including a number of oligarchs. And uh, Turkey has been able to use that also now to position itself as a mediator in the conflict. That's not yet borne uh, any uh, results, but it, it may perhaps turn out to be a, a quite important uh, factor in the resolution um, uh, of, of this context, uh, of, this, uh, of this conflict. It's incidentally also happens to be a boon to Erdogan, who is quite weak, vulnerable politically. The Turkish economy is in very bad shape. And the ability right now that Erdogan has had to sort of pose as this, uh, a key player in this conflict and someone again on the world stage, uh, he's trying to make the most of that. Whether or not that's going to help him uh, get reelected and help his party, we'll, we'll have to wait. But he's certainly tr trying to use that, the conflict to his benefit. And there's, he, he has been able, to, I think, to derive some benefits from, uh, from that. But I want to come back to the, um, the question of Turkish public opinion that uh, Evrena touched on. Is, uh, you know, Turkish polls have been remarkably, uh, uh, one, one would expect that the Turkish perspective on this conflict would be one that would say, okay, uh, here we have a country with which we have a long history of conflict, we, and that's Russia. Uh, we have cooperation with them, but we know they're, uh, they're a they're, have been to us a dangerous neighbor and could be in the future. And therefore, one would expect that uh, Turkish sympathies would be very strongly on the Ukrainian side, as one sees in much of the former post-Soviet uh, sphere. I've been struck by in Kazakhstan, even Russians in Kazakhstan, let alone the Kazakhs themselves. My understanding is that many of them are really quite sympathetic to Ukraine. And here in Azerbaijan, I can say where the government is also pulling off something of a, of a balancing act. I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the majority opinion in the public sphere is much more sympathetic uh, to Ukraine. Yet when one looks at the uh, public opinion polls, one sees a good deal of skepticism about NATO's role in this. And I think this has to do with primarily uh, Turkey's own experience with NATO and the United States in particular, and sort of the souring of Turkish-American relations over the past uh, 15 years. Uh, I, I could go on about that, but maybe rather than do that, I'll, I'll, um, I'll stop here and open it uh, to questions um, because that, that could involve talking about the deterioration of U.S.-Turkish relations. That, that's, that's a broad topic in and of itself. Um, but you know, Jeff and Evren, uh, I think both touched on things such as support for the, 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 the PKK, uh, Fethullah Gulen, um, and these are big things on the Russian side. And then there are a number of complaints on the American side, Turkish violation of uh, sanctions against Iran, the purchase of the S-400s from Russia, uh, et cetera. Okay, wow, thank you. That was really interesting. And all of these presentations have so much in them. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. So I invite members of the audience to post questions in the Q&A. Um, I have so many questions as a kind of outsider, but I want to, I guess while I'm waiting, I could ask, I mean, I don't know if any, oh, wait, didn't have to wait long. Okay, great. Question from one of our master's students here at Harriman Institute, Nikhil Jain. What is the place of Central Asia and the Caucasus in Turkish foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Do you see a greater expansion of Turkish, Turkic alliances in the future? And how do you think this will take shape? Go ahead, Michael. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, that is an excellent question. I think uh, undoubtedly, so one of the big questions I think of, of this war, of course, we don't know how it's going to end. Is it going to end as uh, many people are hoping the West with the overthrow of uh, Putin and even some are speculating about the possibility of Russia itself falling apart. Uh, I wouldn't rule anything out, to be honest. The future, particularly this conflict, is very unpredictable, uh, but nor would I expect that. But I think it is what we are seeing thus far is that Russia is far weaker than many people expected. And to that extent, this, uh, this revelation has has to be seen both in Turkey and for the future of Turkish power as a very um, uh, beneficial uh, development. That is, if Russia is not as strong as it looked, then that means Turkey, relatively speaking, is stronger. And Turkey, again, I mentioned there's this very curious, uh, I think it'd be fair, competitive, they're also cooperative in the caucuses. Uh, but with the, I'm referring particularly to the war in Karabakh, the, the most recent one uh, that took place in which uh, Russia, despite the fact that Turkey played a key role in that conflict with its backing uh, of Azerbaijan, uh, Russia nonetheless was able to, I would say, uh, uh, under, uh, re reemphasize the fact that it's the, the key player in the region um, 
by both mediating the end of that conflict and then by putting peacekeepers in, inside of Karabakh and Turkey as a way, you know, try, attempted to put itself on an equal footing with Russia with the peacekeeping mission, but the Russians simply didn't accept it. Now, however, though, and this is a big concern, uh, particularly in Armenia, which has been quite reliant upon Russian power, a concern that if Russia is greatly weakened, is this going to give that much more uh, room for maneuver and leverage both to Turkey and, and uh, to Azerbaijan? And uh, now how that would be used by Turkey and Azerbaijan uh, remains to be seen, but certainly a, a weaker Russia, I think, bodes, I don't want to say better for either of them, because I think both of them are both would be well, well advised to uh, compromise with, uh, with Armenia and find a solution to this conflict, but they may be tempted to uh, push their advantage harder than they would otherwise without uh, Russia having power. You know, as, as to um, uh, Central Asia, I won't say too much there other than to put that point, remind us that what happened in um, uh, Kazakhstan as the tensions were building in Ukraine, and we saw the, the outbreak of uh, riots in, uh, in, inside of Kazakhstan, which also indicated how unstable that uh, country is, which is another region to keep our eyes on. These, that Central Asia, a uh, number of these uh, Central Asian countries, their economies are quite bound up uh, with Russia's, uh, Kazakhstan's, uh, certainly. And uh, with the economic sanctions provide, uh, promise not just economic pain for Russia, but also for Central Asia, which may only lead to more political instability in Central Asia. And if Russia was able to restore order in Kazakhstan, but again, if it's also now politically weakened as well as economically and militarily weakened, um, then that would, that might, I mean, again, it's very difficult to know what could come out of that. Turkey would, by definition, be, have greater influence there with Russia influence being weaker, but Central Asia is far enough away from Turkey that I don't see it being a major actor. I would look more to, to, to China to potentially play a larger uh, role there. Um, but that, uh, yeah, the, the, the possibility of, of things unfolding in, in Central Asia you know, gives, gives an opportunity perhaps for Turkey to uh, expand uh, its influence. But I would, you know, again, hesitate to, to make any solid predictions about that. Whereas the Caucasus, I think definitely that uh, Turkey Turkey's influence uh, will only increase as a result of this war. Jeff, go ahead. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I just maybe a couple of small things to add. Um, one has to do with energy, because I think one of the outcomes of this conflict is that Europe is increasingly uh, accelerating the pivot away from relying on Russian oil and gas. Um, and that means a lot of different things in, in, in terms of what the alternatives could be. But, um, you know, certainly uh, to the extent that there's going to be a big push for diversification, uh, short of, you know, an energy transition where we move away from oil and gas altogether, uh, I think Turkey's going to end up playing a big role in that. And whether that is, you know, bringing gas from uh, the Caspian or from the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and if it is from the Caspian, then of course that means that Turkey's relationship with Azerbaijan and with Georgia, uh, which hosts the pipelines that are bringing uh, that gas into Turkey and then onward to Europe is gonna be really uh, important. Of course, Russia uh, opposes that kind of diversification. And I think, um, I, I was just in the region, I came back from Georgia uh, about a week ago, and one of the big concerns there uh, is that if Russia is successful in Ukraine, then it's going to have uh, opportunity to then um, put more pressure politically, economically, and militarily um, on the wider region. And part of that could focus on trying to sever some of the lines of communication between the South Caucasus uh, and Europe. Um, that would of course have implications for Turkey. That would make it harder for Turkey to play this role as a, a kind of energy hub that it's uh, long aspired to. If on the other hand, Russia fails, uh, and if Europe does really move towards this uh, pivot away from Russian energy, then I think there's going to be greater focus uh, on this region. And I think among other consequences, that means that Turkey's role uh, in the South Caucasus, uh, sort of coordinating and providing uh, security for some of these energy projects is going to be larger. Um, there's new discussion about Trans-Caspian energy uh, connections, um, you know, producing gas in Turkmenistan and then bringing it across the Caspian to, to the South Caucasus and then through Turkey to, to Europe. That I think is more speculative. Uh, that's been an idea that's been on the table for over 20 years and for a variety of political and economic reasons hasn't really come to fruition. Uh, but I do think that it's, you know, the, the fact that it's once again being discussed, I think is, is significant. Um, beyond that, um, you know, I, I think the, 
um, the, the, the Nagorno-Karabakh war is really interesting because, um, you know, I, I think Turkey won the war, but Russia won the peace. Um, and that is that Turkey showed uh, for the first time that it was willing to directly confront uh, Russia in a, a sort of overt military way and that its, its client, Azerbaijan, actually um, came out on top in that war. But then, it, as, as Michael said, it was unable to uh, sort of displace or position itself alongside Russia in the post-war uh, settlement. If Russia is substantially weakened as a result of the conflict in Ukraine, uh, then I think that um, you could see uh, a more uh, assertive push on the part of Turkey uh, in that region. Uh, one of the big post-war initiatives has been this idea of reconciliation with Armenia, both Turkish Armenian and Azerbaijani Armenian. Um, that is always going to be politically kind of difficult. Um, I think there actually is more political support for it in Armenia now uh, than there was, but it's still going to be a, a, a a pretty hard sell. Uh, Russia doesn't particularly like this idea um, for obvious reasons, especially you know since it's been able to um, maintain its, its uh, political and, and strategic hold on Armenia, even while extending its influence over Azerbaijan in the wake of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. But if there is progress towards this kind of normalization, that could open up additional transport routes, many of which would have to go through Turkey. Um, and it would be something that um, all of the South Caucasus states really uh, support, uh, but that Russia has been one of the big obstacles too. And so if Russia is weakened, uh, is less able to play that kind of uh, spoiler role, um, I think you could see uh, acceleration uh, along this track of normalization. And that would be something where Turkey would play a very prominent role um, and where all three of the South Caucasus states um, would then you know, seek to deepen their ties to Turkey as part of the, this normalization process and the, and the construction of new uh, transit routes through the region. Thank you. I think that um, addresses the question by Professor Fordham William Janus, who asked, does the complexity and number of countries in the Eastern Mediterranean energy development sphere support or inhibit a peaceful resolution in Ukraine? I mean, that's more directly about Ukraine, but um, uh, Jeff's answer spoke to the question of energy. So if anybody wants to talk or expand on uh, this question about with regard to the resolution of the war in Ukraine, um, please feel free. And then let me just throw out the next question. To what extent is Turkey's current foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia driven by Erdogan and some of his personal considerations versus a more durable approach that would continue beyond Erdogan? And actually I was gonna ask about the, um, the nature of, what, what is the state of the current state of the relationship, the personal relationship between Putin and Erdogan since we know it hasn't always been so strong, but what is it lately since this actually, unfortunately, could play a role given um, the way Russian foreign policy has been determined very recently? Does anyone wanna, anybody want to um, answer an aspect of any of these questions, Michael? Yeah, um, I'm so just 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 quickly on that. My, I mean, one of the things I, I mean, Evan, uh, could perhaps correct me if I'm I'm wrong. My impression has been that Erdogan, as this has been sort of his, his way of projecting himself as a world leader, has been um, uh, citing or, or making use of his personal relationship with Putin, at least in the before the Turkish public, and but also with with Zelensky as well. So we talk, you know, Erdogan's had phone calls with such and such, etc. Um, I don't know. I can't. I, I don't know what you. Know, what is the nature of the relationship? Whether they like on uh, phone calls or, or uh, to what extent there is um, communication between the two directly. Uh, but my certainly what I've what I've seen with my call recently is that Erdogan has uh, played on this. So you use his relation to Putin to kind of elevate himself. Say, okay, I'm our our, our economy's uh, terrible right now, but I've put us on the world stage at least. Well, maybe I can add a couple of words here um, about to this question about this personal relationship between Putin and Erdogan. Also, uh, to what extent Turkish foreign policy reflects Erdogan's personality or ideology or whether uh, some of the com components of Turkish foreign policy is going to be du durable after Erdogan. Um, so I agree to what Michael has just said. I mean, um, there is certainly a personal relationship, but we cannot know to what extent it really 
is based on um, liking each other or so. But what I and I don't really know. I mean, there are a couple of uh, phone exchanges that we know between Putin and Erdogan after the Ukrainian crisis. Um, and uh, as far as we know, that uh, they basically discuss um, the. Uh, the negotiation process and uh, the Russian perspective. Uh, uh, I mean, the Putin told the Russian perspective to Erdogan. Uh, that was on the media. Uh, but um, other than that, I really don't know to what, I mean, how that relationship has evolved. But as far as we know, um, uh, without Putin's approval, uh, Turkey couldn't uh, be the, uh, or act as the mediator uh, between um, Ukraine and Russia. So probably uh, Putin still thinks that um, Erdogan is a reliable actor. And um, and um, that is that has been an important component of Russian-Turkish relations. This trust between these two leaders and, and this reliance on uh, their words uh, to each other. And as I tried to explain in the presentation, um, not being overruled uh, through congresses, legislative processes, or other things is very important for both leaders. And the uh, similarity of decision-making processes really makes them to understand each other better, enables them to uh, work together. Uh, they both, uh, in many instances, announced that this is a more efficient relationship. Um, in some cases, uh, they said that this should be the model of the 21st century's diplomatic relations, uh, efficient, reliable, trustworthy, uh, based on, you know, like, um, uh, this um, uh, leadership diplomacy and this and that. Um, so uh, there is definitely a different model there um, at work, um, which both leaders think is more um, efficient um, than more institutionalized and slow decision-making processes of um, EU or NATO and this and that. So that's one part. And in terms of the how uh, much Turkish foreign policy is uh, um, reflecting Erdogan's or AKP's in general, um, um, world views, um, I do think that um, uh, specifically um, in the last uh, four or five years, except some um, components of Turkish foreign policy, majority of the um, AKP's um, foreign po policy acts was basically has been uh, supported by the public. Uh, it's Syrian policy, for example, between 2011 and 2016, when the Turkish government was seen more pro um, opposition forces, specifically pro-Islamic opposition forces in Syria, that wasn't supported. But when Turkish foreign policy became more nationalist and anti-Kurdish in Syria, uh, that uh, became, um, I mean, that really didn't create that much criticism among the opposition, and it was widely shared. Uh, some components, it's expansionism, it's being too much present, it's state-like functions in Syria um, has been under heavy criticism, uh, but um, overall the Syrian policy uh, is, um, is not being that much criticized. Um, again, uh, back in 2011-2016 uh, period where the AKP government was more uh, pro-migrant, accepting refugees from Syria, that was criticized. Criticize. Uh, migration policy is still very much criticized uh, by the opposition. But some components, as I said, um, is basically uh, not going to, I mean, some components of Turkish foreign policy is not going to change that much. Um, they are seen as, I mean, some components are seen as existential uh, for uh, Turkish security, uh, widely shared by everyone. Um, uh, there is so much public support um, in that sense. Uh, but um, uh, if I can summarize, for example, uh, Turkey's um, expansionist attitude in Libya, for example, uh, is also um, may not be continued. I mean, uh, or Turkey's um, conflictual attitude towards its allies, um, or Turkey's uh, suspicious 
um, uh, attitude towards the EU um, may not uh, continue. So uh, we will see a little bit of continuity, but also um, we may see a little bit of continuity, um, but uh, there will be a rupture as well. Um, Okay, um, thank you. Just continuing with this theme and then I'll come back to the question about the caucuses because we have two questions on that. Uh, we have a question and I'm so sorry about my horrible pronunciation. Aitak Yurutku, um, who thanks everyone for this interesting event. And she has a question for Pro Professor Evren who's just been speaking about um, the contingency versus the kind of longstanding motivations of Turkey's foreign policy. And the question is, does the economic crisis uh, which she characterizes as going very badly for Turkey. Um, and as a result of the Russian-Ukrainian war, um, will this have any effect? And could Turkey change its position and move more toward Western powers in the EU? And how would this influence Russian-Turkish relations and um, the, those relations with North Iraq and Syria? So I, I guess if you could frame what you're saying with regard to how she characterizes the recent economic downturn. All right. Um, so as far as I understand whether Turkey's economic crisis, how Turkey's economic crisis is gonna be uh, informing its foreign policy, right? This is a question. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so it has been an important factor in uh, shaping or reshaping Turkey's foreign policy in the last two, three years. As I said, again, it was in my presentation as well. Uh, even though Russia is one of the important partners of Turkey's um, one of the important trade partners of Turkey, uh, still it's basically the EU countries uh, that are the top trade partners with Turkey and Turkey's, uh, and, and Turkey also needs um, lots of FDI coming um, uh, to Turkey and it's basically coming from the Western countries. Uh, so attracting uh, foreign direct investment and keeping the trade intact uh, with the European countries has been one of the major goals of Turkish foreign policy, uh, not just in the last five years, not um, during the economic crisis, but in the uh, whole um, in the last two decades of the AKP's foreign policy. I mean, economic growth is, or um, economic, um, I mean, let me say just economic growth, economic growth is uh, one of the, uh, one of the major, major achievements of AKP and their electoral support has been um, exclusively specifically in the first 10 years, but still uh, dependent on um, uh, sustaining the economic growth. So, um, when it comes to uh, improving Turkey's economy, um, I think it's on the top list of Turkey, uh, Turkey's policymakers, and um, the role of the West and the EU in general is very important in terms of um, uh, sustaining that. But as I said, Russia is also very important. I mean, for specific sectors. And when uh, Russia had the sanctions on Turkey in between 2015 and 2016, uh, two sectors really got hit hard. And that was tourism almost collapsed. Um, I mean, the, the, the number of tourists coming to Turkey dropped 90%, 95% uh, for um, a year. And you have the construction companies operations completely fully stopped in Russia. And that really um, uh, made a huge difference in turn for those two sectors. And um, if also trade lobbies and economic lobbies really uh, play a lot of role in Turkey's foreign policy. And these are the two most um, powerful uh, uh, trade lobbies, economic lobbies in Turkey that has an effect on um, uh, Turkey's foreign policy decision-making processes. Uh, we do know that Turkey um, uh, really um, made its relations better or uh, Erdogan apologized to Putin uh, in 2016 partly because of um, its um, resentment um, uh, for, of, of the West and Western reaction to the coup. But it was also partly because uh, the construction sector lobby really put a lot of pressure uh, on, uh, on Erdogan to, uh, to normalize its relations with Russia. Um, so what I'm saying is that um, uh, Turkey, under this economic uh, crisis, 
could not really sustain and endure uh, either sanctions or not, uh, or having a crisis sort of a crisis situation with Russia. So economically speaking, it's very important for Turkey to keep um, uh, Russia in the circle, but that depends on uh, the Western um, response. If West really pushes Turkey uh, to a certain direction, if Turkey has to choose, um, because of the West. I mean, Russia isn't going to be doing that, but the, as I said, the transatlantic alliance may choose to that if war uh, hangs on. Um, then I think uh, the prior, I mean, the economic interests mainly lies in Europe and in the US, uh, which the economic ties have been increasing in the last three, four years, even though uh, the US and Turkish, I mean, diplomatic relations soared, uh, I mean, got worsened in the last uh, three or four years. It, economic relations was actually uh, getting better. Okay, thank you. And um, now uh, two questions about the, the caucuses from Brenda Tannenbaum. Would Russia use nukes rather than give up its influence in the caucuses? So how, how committed do our panelists see Russia to the caucuses? And then a question from Leon Musgrave. Um, could you please discuss Turkey's relations with Georgia and how those relations factor in to relations with Armenia? Yeah, I yeah. guess uh, on the question of the nuclear question, I think fortunately I don't, I have difficulty imagining right now a scenario where uh, Russia would be tempted to use uh, nuclear weapons uh, in the caucuses. I mean, one, one, one could imagine a scenario, suppose, where uh, Turkey was uh, asserting itself in the Caucasus, and let's say a war broke out between Azerbaijan and Armenia and Turkey, and Turkey was rolling in in Armenia and, and Russia. In fact, actually, such a scenario, Russia, in fact, had threatened this in the, the 1990s, that uh, uh, Turkey had better watch itself. And um, there was reference made you know, with Turkey being a NATO member, but Russia would also have nuclear weapons. Um, so actually, it's it perhaps not as unimaginable as I was, I was uh, first thinking. Um, but I don't, I don't think, I mean, so there's the South Caucasus, which I don't think Russia ultimately would be willing to actually use nuclear weapons uh, for. Maybe they would be willing to make nuclear threats. The North Caucasus is a more interesting question. Um, you know, that, of course, is the, the uh, was wars in Chechnya and the, the fact that Russia was losing control of the North Caucasus at that time, not just uh, Chechnya, but it looked like perhaps Dagestan, too, was going to slip out of the control, which I should point out was not due to the, any popular sentiment in Dagestan. They, in fact, turned out to be solidly behind Russia. They did not want to see uh, their part of the Russian Federation fall into uh, chaos under um, uh, Islamists. Um, but that that would be so that brought it was that conflict that brought uh, Putin to power. And that did have a lot of the Russians saying, look, without the North Caucasus, we really are finished as as a state of any consequence. Um, so I would just draw a distinction between the North Caucasus and the South Caucasus. One could also point out that people such as uh, you know Putin's great critic, uh, Navalny, uh, is something of a strong Russian nationalist strain inside of him uh, who resents the fact that Russia subsidizes the North Caucasus with so much uh, so much money. And uh, and he's not alone in that sentiment in Russia. And there is a substantial number of people inside of Russia who would say, "Let them, you know, get. We don't want to support them. Get them off our backs, anyhow." Uh, so that that would be. There, there's very sharp diverging opinions on the the place of the North Caucasus inside of, uh, of Russia. Um, and there, it's probably certainly right now, it's a part of Russia, the Russian Federation, which I don't think would want to break from Russia because they are quite economically uh, dependent um, uh, on it. So yeah, it's, uh, I'll end there. Jeff? Yeah, if I could jump in here. So on the nuclear use question, I think it's quite unlikely. Uh, Russia has been pretty clear in its doctrinal statements about the conditions under which it would use nuclear weapons. And those are in response to nuclear use against Russia or its allies, or if there's a conventional uh, threat to the integrity of the Russian state. Um, and even in the context of the war in Ukraine so far, um, there has been a, uh, 
a, d despite concern in the West about the potential for Russia to use, especially a kind of non-conventional nuclear, or, um, sorry, uh, non-strategic nuclear weapon, um, in practice, you know, it looks like no preparations have been made for that. Um, the the signaling coming out of Moscow has been very uh, restrained in terms of the circumstances under which uh, nuclear use would be possible. Now, that's not to rule out that you know, if some kind of crisis were to uh, escalate that there could be a, a decision taken on a on a very short notice uh, to escalate to nuclear use. But at least as far as we can believe what Russia has written in its doctrinal statements, uh, none of the contingencies relevant to anything that would happen in the South Caucasus, short of the use of nuclear weapons against Russian forces, would rise to the level uh, of a contingency where Russia would contemplate nuclear use. Now, as Michael said, the North Caucasus is potentially a different story because one of the things that Russian nuclear doctrine does point to is threats against the integrity of the Russian state. Uh, and the North Caucasus is part of the Russian state. So I suppose one could envision a scenario in which Moscow views that uh, it's in danger of losing the North Caucasus to um, not just you know domestic separatism, but also to uh, some kind of a rival power, in this case, let's say Turkey, uh, and then decides that that rises to the level of, at which it would consider using nuclear weapons. I find that contingency a little bit hard to imagine, but it's certainly not entirely outside the realm uh, of the possible. Um, but again, I, I would put the, the likelihood as, as being extremely low. Uh, as far as Georgia goes, so uh, Georgia and Turkey have a very good relationship, um, and uh, that encompasses a number of different things. So Georgia is a key transit route uh, for energy as well as for uh, ordinary logistics. Uh, this dates back to the 1990s and the first efforts to construct uh, first oil and then gas pipelines uh, from the Caspian to Europe. Uh, the baku tbilisi jehan pipeline uh, was first conceptualized in the mid-1990s. It finally came online in the mid-2000s, and that created it's a community of interest between Azerbaijan, which is the main energy producer, Georgia, which is a transit state, and then Turkey, which is the consumer, and then eventually um, helps um, transit some of that oil and, and now gas as well uh, onto consumers in Europe. That community of interest has come to entail not only cooperation on energy, but on other issues as well. So there's uh, been security cooperation among those three states, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey, uh, that began with a focus on protection of critical infrastructure and has subsequently expanded into other realms as well. Uh, there's now joint training uh, among the militaries and the security services of the three countries. Um, there's cooperation among the um, civilian agencies that oversee uh, defense and security. Um, there is uh, Turkey providing uh, weapons and training uh, for the militaries more in Azerbaijan than in Georgia, uh, but uh, in Georgia as well. Now, um, with the conflict in Ukraine, uh, what, uh, among the issues of which is uh, the role of NATO, uh, so there's been this talk, potentially Ukraine could commit to some kind of non-bloc status that would have then an external security guarantee. Um, I'm skeptical that that would work, uh, but nevertheless, this is something that's been discussed and that uh, President Zelensky has raised. Um, again, I, I was just in Georgia and you know people uh, with close ties to the Georgian government are watching this debate very closely um, and believe that if that is something that Ukraine uh, is able to secure, that Georgia would then seek to do something very similar. And the key player, apart from the United States and such an initiative would be Turkey, uh, which is the country that has the largest uh, conventional military in NATO outside the United States, uh, and which has, you know, because of these ties going back to the 1990s and the focus on transit and energy, has uh, an interest in maintaining security and stability in the South Caucasus. Um, and, you know, if there's going to be some kind of commitment to, you know, security guarantees outside the framework of NATO, uh, Turkey would play a, a significant role in that. Again, I don't know how feasible that is, you know, for Ukraine, much less for Georgia, but at least it's something that's being um, talked about. And at a minimum, uh, the Georgians are very interested in deepening their defense and security cooperation with Turkey. Um, they recognize that on their own, they don't really have the capability to resist uh, Russian military activity. Um, and there is this concern that whatever happens in Ukraine, that Georgia is going to be on the front lines of Russia's next um, act of, of external aggression. And so in preparation for whatever may be to come, uh, one of the areas where Georgia is very interested in building up ties and building up capabilities is by deepening that relationship with Turkey. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we have to finish up in one minute, but um, I just wanted to ask a question of our panelists since you were sitting in a very different place than the U.S., um, and this is about the war. I'm just wondering if the uh, recent revelation of 
you know, human rights atrocities by the Russian army in Ukraine has been felt or how that's been perceived or whether it's even entered into any of the conversations where you sit, wh whether among ordinary people or among elites. And, and if it has, do you have any sense of whether the perception of human rights abuses in Ukraine shifts the needle or does it just sort of fit into already the, the kind of narratives and beliefs that um, exist toward um, you know, attitudes about Russia or the kind of, of narratives um, that Michael discussed in his talk. Yeah, go ahead, Evren. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think the latter, I mean, the, 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 it's basically uh, the already emerging um, narrators in the context of Ukrainian conflict um, is basically once again, uh, dominating the human rights violations of the Russian military. Uh, I mean, uh, the disinformation um, um, of the uh, Russian media environment is still present in Turkey very much. Uh, one, this is also an important component um, of um, the shaping public pu public opinion and public attitudes towards the Russian uh, uh, the uh, conflict in Ukraine. Uh, right now, I mean, Sputnik is present um, here still, um, and, um, and, and, and and that really affects a lot um, how uh, the human rights violations are being framed here. Um, I think um, the attitudes towards the conflict um, was basically shaped um, whether um, this idea of um, Western conspiracy towards Russia and Ukraine um, is uh, pretty much, I mean, not now Ukraine, but let me say differently. The, this, there is this idea in Turkey, which is very dominant, uh, that um, what's going on um, in uh, Ukraine and the atrocity is that the Russian military is um, military is basically committing is not the truth. It's basically um, a fact, um, a, a misinformation campaign and dominated and directed by the West. Uh, so if you have already anti-Western attitudes and suspicious of the Western intentions, so this narrative really overlaps uh, with with this, you know, like uh, being um, a Western lie or or this and that. Uh, so I think um, this the, you can you can find this narrative in Turkey a lot. But at the same time, uh, there's a lot of sympathy to the Ukrainian cause, uh, to Zelensky, and to the uh, Ukrainian people in general. And what you see is a very polarized environment in that sense. A recent survey, uh, there was a recent survey. Uh, asking uh, whether Russia is right, whether you support NATO and this and that. Uh, I don't remember the specific questions right now, uh, but it seems that 50% of the Turkish population uh, thinks that this uh, war happened because of NATO expansion. And uh, it's basically uh, Russians uh, who have become um, the victims of the Western imperialism and made a mistake there, um, um, but it's basically um, a consequence of um, NATO enlargement, Western imperialism and this and that. So that narrative is here, it's very strong and all the other facts really uh, basically um, reframed um, or um, included in this larger uh, framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. I guess that's what I expected to hear. Um, Jeff? Okay, yeah, really briefly, because I know we have to right. go. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that this emphasis on uh, human rights abuses and war crimes is quite prominent in the uh, public discourse here in the United States, certainly here in Washington. I can't speak for what it's like out in, um, you know, outside the, the DC bubble. Um, but here it's been very much uh, talked about in the media. Uh, you see it in in ordinary con in conversations with people with ordinary people you know, who are talking about the war. Um, I've been quite struck by the number of Ukrainian flags I see just sort of walking around, not only on government buildings but on you know in individual residences. I will say that there is an ecosystem on both the far right and the far left 
uh, where they kind of intersect at the extremes that tend to downplay this. Um, and we've seen this, you know, with some of the talking heads on, on Fox News, but we've also seen it, you know, with people like Noam Chomsky, um, who are trying to, you know, question the, the dominant narrative about what's going on, about the causes of the conflict, and maybe the extent to which Russia is responsible for some of these uh, atrocities that have been widely reported. Thank you. I, yeah, I would just um, add, uh, yeah, yeah, I think, as, as Jeff said, there is, uh, my impression, I've been outside the United States now for quite some time, but my impression from watching U.S. media is that there really is a bubble in the media, and I would, not just the U.S., but also when I, was, I was in Britain the last, uh, last week, um, and prior to that, I was in, in, in Turkey, and now I'm back again in um, Azerbaijan. My impression, the Western media really is in something of a bubble, and there is, I would, you know, I, some very, quite hysterical on some points about the uh, war in Ukraine. Um, and in fact, what I was struck in, in Russia when the war began is that the Russian media was much more subdued, I would say, for about the first week of, of the war, um, maybe because the reality of the fact that they were getting involved in the war. And of course, it wasn't they, don't, they were, were not referring to it as such as a war. And that also had, had to do with it. But, you know, just to, to, to touch on the question about the atrocities is that um, They've gotten tremendous amount of attention inside the United States, but there have also been uh, examples of um, uh, Ukrainian forces committing a number of uh, atrocities, which I've not seen that in U.S. media, but I've seen it um, elsewhere. Uh, and not to say that I, my impression is not that they're, they're, they cancel each other out in any way. Um, but I, I'm struck by and rather disappointed by the fact that the, the U.S. media and Western media uh, doesn't play that any attention. Along with that, also just to emphasize, as, as Jeff said, there's been you know, this talk of Russia using nuclear weapons inside of Ukraine, chemical weapons. My impression, my understanding has been really this is not something the Russians are seriously considering well, in the same way that they have not used their firepower uh, to the extent that they could to uh, kill civilians. And it's often presented in the way uh, stories are written in the West that you know, Russia is doing everything it can to uh, kill as many people uh, in Ukraine as possible. Um, so coming back again, how does the, the story, the atrocity narratives affected um, uh, populations outside of uh, the West, and so I can, you know, in, in Turkey, in Azerbaijan, people are aware of it, and I think it has um, uh, definitely has swayed more sympathy for Ukraine. But I don't think, as everyone was saying, I don't think it's actually caused anyone to change their narrative. Um, that is, they're uh, aware that this sort of thing is going on in you know, Azerbaijan. It definitely, I should say, I mean, this is all very anecdotal, um, but has, at an emotional level, has, has um, uh, affected people. Um, whereas in Turkey, I get my sense is yes, then they get sort of, but on the other hand, you know, there is the question the NATO perhaps having provoked this, you know, along with uh, the US. Um, and that might be explained by the fact that Azerbaijan has you know, been part of this, they could see themselves in Ukrainians' uh, feet much more, maybe more easily than, than the Turks. And also the fact that part important part of Azerbaijani historical memory is what happened in um, a Black January. Uh, in 1990, when there was a crackdown on uh, Azerbaijanis protesting in Baku by Soviet forces that killed 100 something um, uh, peaceful uh, civilians, citizens of what was then the Soviet Union. And there's sensitivity, perhaps that's another reason why I think I've, I've gotten the sense again, this is anecdotal, that um, there's a bit more emotional uh, uh, ties to what the Ukrainians are, are uh, experiencing. But I do think, I mean, one of the things I've been fascinated by is the, uh, is, is the media coverage of this war. And I found it quite lacking uh, in, in, in the West, which isn't to say I found it good well, in Russia. I mean, that, that goes without saying. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 we can't, this is not the place to get into it, though. I would say that <clears throat> it's true that the information space has been dominated here in the U.S. by um, the pro-U.S., pro-Ukrainian position. But it's also true that the nature of war crimes is of a massively different level, right? Like systematic targeting of civilians, which is decided by the highest levels of the Russian government, is not the same thing as. Yeah, that, I guess uh, maybe in. Well, I, I'm not. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I just want to say I'm not. I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I'm yet. Uh, I'm not convinced the, there is has been such systematic. But then again, I've not studied this in any. It's not really. Way, so I'll yeah. I'll defer to you on that. Right. No, I mean I I agree that we've all been marveling at how the information space has been so tightly. Um, and, you know, carefully um, defined by the Ukrainian government. I mean, that's what they've, that's what, that's what they're doing, you know, for various reasons, domestic and 
to gain international support. But I, the reason I asked the question is because what we see in Bucha is next level, uh, um, just yes, you know, right. murder of civilians. And so that's why I asked whether this is kind of breaking through in Turkey or, or, or in um, Baku through the kind of um, existing channels of the media and, and changing how people think about things, or if it's just sort of seen as like, oh, this is what happens in war. Uh, but okay, so that's just that was just to end on the on the on the on the war note. But I want to say that this has been a really fascinating panel that covered so many of the deeper economic and security and political issues, both domestic and foreign, over many years. Uh, so thank you for such a wide ranging discussion. Uh, we're most appreciative to you, and um, you know, thank you for your time. This is going to be posted online and we will have um, more viewers and, and more interested people who always watch our videos after they are um, completed, <clears throat> either on YouTube or on our Facebook page. So um, I would like to thank Jeff, Michael, Evren, as well as Sabachi Center uh, for helping me to organize this panel, um, as well as Carly Jackson for putting it together. And of course, um, Carnegie Foundation. And uh, hopefully, you know, we can all talk again in the future if this pandemic would allow us to do so. <laughs> so um, thanks everyone and, and thank you for all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thanks everyone.